Hi everyone, folks. Welcome to the session. We have our speaker for the day here, Bianca. She's a senior software engineer who lives in Rio, Brazil. Works at Red Hat. Stage is all yours, Bianca. Hello. Uh, okay. Can I start? Yep. Sure. Please go ahead. Sure. Sharing my screen here. Uh, so here I, I wanted to give a talk about uh, shutting down Go routines gracefully. DevConf, uh, and thank you for, for the introduction. I, I am a, I'm a senior software engineer at Head Hat, as previously introduced, and I, I'm i also like at Head Hat helping build a product that will help customers manage their route for edge devices. And the inspiration for this talk actually came from an example that happened during the early development of this product, since it's a, like an MVP. Uh, we are, instead of creating a bunch of microservices, we decided to create a, a big Go uh, application. And instead of like using queries and doing uh, development more uh, asynchronously, we're using Go routines for some things. So uh, this is an example that comes from, from a, a real, real world example. Uh, before Hat Hat, I worked as a SRE tech lead manager at Stone. It, it is a Brazilian fintech that helps Brazilian entrepreneurs with some of their needs, receiving payments, uh, banking are a couple of examples. And I, I joined it first as a developer and then eventually got interested in the SRE path. So uh, I'm more like a backend uh, engineer that likes a lot of infrastructure in DevOps and is very interested in that, but I'm not that good as an SRE as I am as a software engineer. Um, Python and Go are my two favorite languages, uh, but I've worked with a lot of languages, technologies before these last two jobs. So uh, in the end, I think I found my, my passion in Python and Go. Uh, and if anyone has any questions, uh, I'll be happy to answer by the end of the Q&A or afterwards on Twitter or like whatever platform you find me, I can, I can probably uh, chat and answer those questions. So first, I want to start with, a, with an agenda so you can have like an idea of what to expect of this talk. Uh, we're we're going to start uh, having some fun with Go routines. I say fun because I have a lot of fun, but I, I don't think my definition of fun is the same as everyone else's. Uh, and then uh, we're going to see a lot of live code. Hope that uh, the goddesses of live code are with me today. If they're not, we're going to have a problem. And we will learn how to finish the work that these Go routines that we uh, created uh, that are running. Uh, we're going to learn how to finish the work that they are doing properly. And then uh, how to listen to system signals. And eventually, we will enter into a topic about how to handle, handle interrupts in a production environment because uh, in this whole example that we faced in Hat Hat, uh, everything was working properly locally, but then we got into a production environment and it wasn't. So uh, there, there are some gotchas that I kind of wanted to share. So first I wanted to say hello, and by hello I say hello and actually go. I'm gonna be sharing the VS Code window and the and the Chrome tab a couple of times. There it is, hope you can all see it. So I created a folder called a DevConf here. If the phone size is, too, is not nice, we, we, can, we can adjust. Uh, we're gonna create a file named Mingo. And there we are. Send our first hello word in Go. We're gonna create a, a function main. And it's actually pretty simple. Uh, as, a, as a Python developer, I, I, I got pleasantly surprised when I first started working with Go, because it's actually pretty simple. Uh, you just need, need to declare your package, import the FMT package, and just do your hello world. There we go. Uh, so we have the first hello world running which is super cool uh, and actually super simple. And going back to the 
presentation. I'm happy to actually be interrupted at any time if, if someone has questions with me while. So just shout out. Okay. And after we, we give like the first um actually I said yeah. Uh, after we we give our, our hello word, I wanted to spawn some go routines. Like we said, we're gonna have some fun with go routines here. Uh, and I wanted to start by saying what are go routines. Go routines that are functions within a go code. Uh, they are not exactly OS threads, but they are in like green threads either. They they're a special kind of go routine. They are deeply integrated with Go's runtime. And uh, instead of like defining their own suspensions or reentry points, Go runtime will observe the behavior of those Go routines and automatically suspend them and resume depending on what is running inside of them. In the sense that when you make a blocking call in a Go routine, like a request to an external service or uh, you were waiting for something to happen, the Go runtime will recognize that this is a blocking call and like there is some IO blocking this call and we'll stop the execution and only come back when it's expected to have it ready, the, the result of this call. So other Go routine can run instead of this one. So it gives like the, uh, it gives the idea of parallelism because it, it feels like everything's running together, just like other coroutines. If you look at how coroutines work in other languages, uh, it feels like they are running out together, but actually uh, what what's happening is that Go Runtime is observing what's going on in the back in the background and uh, stopping and resuming the Go routines depending on, on what's going on. So uh, this is like the whole concurrency parallelism talk, which is which could be a, a, a whole one hour talk. Uh, but the most special thing here is that we have a main function that is actually Go routine itself. And it, it can launch an other Go routines that run concurrently to it. And uh, in this other Go routines can spawn other Go routines. So to, you can like have a lot of Go routines running in your program and they are super lightweight. So they are not heavy things. You don't have to worry too much about uh, like creating too many Go routines you have to worry about memory and synchronization issues as like as always when you uh, do things concurrently and etc. So since we're here, like introduction again, uh, let's spawn some Go routines and see how they're working. And then VS Code again. There we go. Um, we're going to use the, the, the Go um, keyword to create this Go routine, and we can create an anonymous function to run it. Like, we can say, I am a Go routine. Uh, and this, since it's an anonymous function, I have to call it here. So it has the parentheses. I could also uh, define a new function here, call it Go routine and also run it like that. Um, hello. Both examples say they are perfectly fine. You're going to see a lot of those two. And there we go. Oh, and there is a, a, a tricky thing here. We are spawning the Go routines, but we are not actually uh, waiting for them to finish. So this is like one of the main things that I wanted to, to talk in this, in this presentation is that when we, when we create our, our Go routines, the main program that, that creates them, it's forking that Go routine, but we are not creating a join point. Go is using a fork join method. And when we just create them, we're forking, but the, but you have to actually create the joint point so you can have so you can wait for the results of this go routine uh, for your program to actually stop. So what we can do here is that 
we can use system, uh, we can use weight groups for that. So I'm going to go back to the slides super quick to talk about weight groups, and then we go back to the code. Uh, there it is. Okay. So about finishing work properly. As I said, like program execution is going to begin with the main package and then invokes from the function main. When that function invocation is returns, your program is going to exit. It doesn't wait for other no main go routines to complete. So uh, the question is, how do we do if we want to wait? And if we want to wait until the go routine is done, we're going to need to tell the main program that we want to wait. We're going to have to, to somehow warn it that, hey, I have some work going on inside of another go routine, and I want you to wait for it before actually finishing, closing. Uh, we can do this with, uh, Go has a bunch of synchronizations techniques. It's super worthwhile to take a look at Go sync package for that. Uh, you will have uh, mutex, you have uh, weight groups, channels. Uh, there are so many uh, ways to conditions. There are so many ways to, to figure out uh, how to do synchronization within Go. And depending on what is your use case, you might want one or the other. For this one, I think a weight group is perfectly fine. So let's give it a go to actually create that weight group. So we see our goal routines actually uh, in, uh, our main goal routine waiting for the other ones. Uh, and one thing that is nice to see here is that if you if you are on a on a live example, if this if this were a uh, an HTTP server that is normally always running until it, a deployment happens or it exits for some reason, you wouldn't be seeing that the goal routine is not uh, being waited for because uh, what's going to happen is that for some reason you have some other processes blocking your main function, like uh, if, if it was an HTTP server, uh, and you wouldn't be seeing that the goal routines aren't running. You would have the illusion that they are and then uh, when your program exits, you can stop any of them or not. You, you wouldn't be aware of it. It wouldn't be so clear. So that, that this example makes it super clear. I'm going to delete that one and just keep the anonymous function. Like we said, we're going to create a weight group. Weight group is on the sync package. Like I said, we have a, a bunch of other uh, tools that we can use, like mutex, we have pools, uh, like if you're thinking of connection pools, database pools, so you can use the same uh, idea. Uh, we can use the once block to make something uh, execute just once. And here we have the weight group. Uh, for the weight group, I'm going to tell that it needs to actually wait for my function to be to run so I can close the program. And another thing that I can do here is that every time that I create something, a go routine, I can add something to my wait group. So what I'm saying here, hey, I'm spawning one go routine. Like, where are comments? Yeah. One go routine is being created. And, uh, I want you to wait for it. Now, I'll go routines are sleep, deadlock. Oh, yeah, of course. Let, let's just add a time sleep of a couple of seconds. Import time, 
don't think I did. Second had an extra ness. Okay, just setting a, a time slip here, uh, just to make sure that the go routine started because everything was happening so fast that when we were waiting to go routine didn't actually. Uh, I don't exactly know why it's complaining about the, about the deadlock, but, oh, yeah, sure. It's complaining about the deadlock because I forgot something very important here. Uh, we have to, on our weight group, we have to add Dawn to let the weight group know that our go routine finished it. And I obviously forgot it. So... By the time it reaches uh, this block of code and there are no uh, go routines running in our program uh, and Don hasn't been called, go runtime is going to realize that, uh, why, what am I waiting for? I, I'm, I'm not waiting for anything. There we go. Now it's going to sleep for 10 seconds and it's going to close as soon as it gets done. That is better, a lot better. Okay, and instead of creating just one, we can actually create a bunch uh, of Go routines. Uh, let's make sure we are creating uh, a couple of Go routines here to make this example a little bit better for the next exciting thing. So I'm gonna I'm gonna use fifty Go routines running for ten seconds each. And for there we go. Yes, okay. So now I'm creating uh, fifty goal routines and running. I'm gonna at this time sleep inside of my goal routine to make sure it's a long running goal routine. So every each one of those will run for about 10 seconds. Let's make it five, make it easier. Five seconds, 50 goal routines running for five seconds each. And in the end, we have to wait for all of them. And we can say that, hey, it's gone. Oh yeah, I did. Thank you. <laughs> I wanted to use the constant seconds. Great. Uh, and now, all right, we're sh we're creating some go routines. We're waiting for them. We are. We have to make sure we are adding them to the wait group before the go routine actually starts. If you do that. Uh, actually, Go is going to complain if you do that inside of this block of code. This is actually uh, wrong because uh, you can reach the wait block before you added all of your Go routines to the wait group. So this has to be done in the synchronous block, and then you can do your asynchronous block. So this is actually how we can wait for some work to be done in Go routines, wait groups. So if you're doing like some sort of program that is creating a lot of goal routines, you want to make sure that inside of your goal routines, you have a way of telling the main goal routine that your work is done in those uh, in those goal routines that you created. Otherwise, your program can just exit and uh, you were going to lose the work that you're doing inside of them, which was what was happening with us in the beginning. Um, coming back to the slides. Um, and there is, there is a, a problem here that what if I want to exit earlier? Because what I just showed there, we were creating the goal routines. We were doing something inside of them, running for five seconds each. But 
I couldn't stop before. Uh, five seconds is a, it's not a lot of time, but if those were go routines that kept running for half an hour, uh, for, for some reason, like maybe I'm waiting for something on an external service. Maybe I created something and I'm waiting for, for an answer of an external service. Uh, what can I do to exit earlier and still make sure that whatever is happening inside of my goal routines are uh, not like the, the, the work is not being uh, terminated in a way that is going to somehow hurt my application, somehow uh, keep, get my data in a bad in a bad situation where I don't know what is the status of what was currently happening and work can be just simply lost depending on what you're doing there. So can, can, can we act on an interruption? Can we actually exit earlier and, and Hey, I, I want to start my program before my go routines. Uh, and can we do that? And the answer is yes, we can do that by listening to system signals. And when we go to system signals, uh, we can start listening to them to handle the execution of our program. Uh, when I say like system signals, I, I mean actual physics signals. Uh, you can go to like any Linux page that shows you what they are, uh, what they mean. And the first signals that I kind of wanted to, to briefly go over here, there are so many of them, we, we definitely don't, don't have the time to go through all of them. But uh, the first three ones that are, uh, that are here, SIG N, SIG term, and SIG Q, they are termination signals. Uh, when, when your application gets a, a second, it means that an interrupt signal was received from normally a keyboard, uh, some sort of input from the user. And SIG term is going to mean that a generic terminal, it's a generic terminal signal. Uh, and your program has to simply terminate. Uh, when you go to SIG queue, it's more like an instant queue signal and it can be interrupted. Uh, normally, when we when we're Linux users and we can't um, something is like not working on our computers, we are very used to doing like sig kill by doing the kill minus nine when we are early Linux users, and that is actually pretty bad for applications because it sends like an instant kill and does not give the app time to do anything. It's just like an instant kill, uh, no time to wrap up anything. It cannot be interrupted. It cannot be acted upon. So we should avoid CQs as much as, as we can. Um, and one that I kind of wanted to talk about, but the, it's not going to be super important for us right now, is six stop. It is not a termination signal. Uh, it's a stop one. And it means that whenever you can, uh, whenever you want, you can send a SIG continuation, like a SIG con signal to your program, and your program should resume execution. So just like SIG kill, SIG stop cannot be interrupted or caught or acted upon, because it's mostly handled by the, the operational system. And we normally don't have to care too much about this system signals, because the language runtime, your operational system is going to handle them for you. But if you're worried about having something happening on the background on your Go application uh, that you actually want to act upon before your Go application closes, system signals are the way to go because you can actually uh, listen to them, subscribe to, to them, and figure out what's going on. So yes, we can do that, and we can listen to a signal by using Go's notify function and passing a channel to it. So something that we can do here is I'm going to first. Yeah. If you're wondering like what a ghost channel is, uh, a ghost channel is like a mechanism for, for go routines communicate against each other. It's pretty common that 
uh, you're going to see uh, communication by channel uh, amongst go routines. It's actually the right way to go routines to communicate. And it's mainly like a publisher subscribe sort of uh, thing in memory uh, within the, the go runtime. So when your program receives that signal, if you're going to receive a value in that side, in that channel. So let's say that I have a, a, a SIG term sent by my keyboard. Uh, we're going to have, we're going to create a channel in it in Go and listen to that SIG term. And we are going to be able to run some code before we actually exit the Go program. Like I said, uh, communication by channel is super common against most Go routines. And it is like the right way to pass values from one Go routine to another because uh, if you just pass by value and not by channel, like if you create a variable and use inside of the Go routine, you don't actually know when the, the value is going to be available inside of your Go routine and vice versa. So uh, it's very hard to, because Go routines, you don't have a guarantee uh, about the time that the, this code is going to execute. So it's very hard to know if your value is going to be available. So channels are really good for you to know that you have a value available at this time in the, inside of your Go routines. So let's let's go to this. Um, I'm gonna share this code again. Window, there we go. So when we Let me something here. And okay. Like I said, we need we need a channel. And let's let's create it here under there. Um like sick. Right, that, that is okay. And it can be a channel of OS signal. It's a type that Go allows us to use. Normally, we, we make that channel of OS signal. I think I might need to do it like. I can create a channel of OS signal. And uh, like I said, we can use Go's notify function to do that. So let me go back here. Signal is the packaging goal that we want to use here. And Go's notify function is going to help us to listen to that signal and Whenever an interrupt happens, a channel is going to receive a value. So this is super cool because uh, we can actually listen to that channel now. And whenever we get a, a, a value here, what we're actually telling Go now is that wait here until I have a value for that variable. I want, I want you to wait. And everything here is going to be synchronous from now on. So if I say something here, like received an interrupt, uh, if I say something like here, like I received an interrupt, this block of code will only run after my interrupt has been received by my application. So in the in the situation that we have now, I'm gonna add like more seconds here, 120. Now we have super long running Go routines, and I am not gonna wait for them anymore because otherwise it, this is gonna take forever. I just want to show that um, that interrupt is gonna be working. So. Okay, when I when I say that the interrupt is gonna be working here, 
Oh, yes, sure. I also I actually want to do that inside of my inside of my go routines because if I do it uh, outside, actually no no no, going back. I get nervous. <laughs> I get super nervous. So we are we're receiving the interrupt and let me go back to. Just want to make sure that I'm gonna get that interrupt correctly and go five let me go back to the where we go yeah we have the hello word yeah that's it we have the hello word and we have the the signal waiting for the interrupts and now we can Control C, and we can catch that interrupt and actually do something after uh, we get it, which is super cool. But now we have to integrate with our Go routine. Otherwise, uh, we're not waiting for them. We're not doing what we wanted. So let's do that now. I wanted to first create a create a, a better structure for the tasks. Otherwise, uh, we're not going to be seeing exactly what is going on here. So let's let's rewrite, rewrite your code a little bit. So I'm going to create a type task struct in the status. Yes. Um, To create a type test struct with a status, and instead of just doing something here that adds one here, I'm gonna create a new task for each one of those things. Ask, and the ID is gonna be the integer, and the status is gonna be started. So if I have my task T with the status started, what I want is that after it's done here, I want to change the status to done. But if it gets interrupted by a by an OS signal, I want the status to be interrupted. So we can achieve that by let's come here. Create a list of tasks so we don't lose track of them. And get task T inside of that list. Actually, need to create a list of pointer of tasks here. Okay. Uh, this list has, I have to declare a size for it. Otherwise, it's not going to work. I can drop this, actually. So I'm going to create a, a, a test list with the size n, which is the amount of tests that we are creating. And every time, we're going to have that wait here, right? Leaving the wait here and getting the the code where we get the OS signal inside of a different go routine. So what we want with that? We want to make sure that we have something running before we wait for our tasks that we will get the OS signals. And when we have that here, we can uh, go through our tasks and check if they are not done. And if they are not done, we can actually interrupt it. So we can go like, branch to the tasks. And if tasks I can 
put that for simplicity. We can mark it as finish it. This is only going to work because uh, I'm This is only going to work because I am using like a pointer of a test here. If I weren't uh, changing the status here, wouldn't change anything. But since I'm using the same object, it's okay. Like I'm using the pointer of a task here and everything's perfectly fine. Task status here. And one thing that we do have to make sure is that when we pass values inside to inside of our go routine, we have to uh, make sure that we are sending them as parameters. Otherwise, the value of t can change throughout the, the execution, and you might not have to correct correct task here. So, what you wanna is actually send the task here. It's t, I think. Yeah. Okay. I wrote a lot of code now. I'm gonna read this to see if i forgot something okay creating tasks adding to the weight group go function that does a super long wait change the status if done okay we're gonna mark them as finish it like like i said we can actually say that or or working in that go routine is done here i think that makes sense for me i don't know if it makes sense for everyone else at this point uh let's go okay so something is happening in the background like i said stop sign on we received an interrupt and the wait got done here like uh we the wait method return it because we call it the done uh, method for each one of the tests that were not finished. Yet. What we can do here to have like a better overview of what just happened is that we can say that that I'm gonna copy and paste because it's easier. We can say that uh, SKD uh, has a status finish it. Let's go. Whoopsie. Actually finish it running. Say finish it, finish it, finish it. Uh, because I said I didn't finish it here, but I wanted to say interrupted. Okay. The actual example for this use it on a known for, for status is good. I forgot to do that. Okay, good. So if we were to wait uh, 120 seconds, we were gonna see the status is done. So if we do like five seconds, we're gonna see the status is done. So this is just one of the ways that we can uh, have to listen to a system signal uh and do some work that is needs to be done regarding your goal routines and then actually uh finish in a way that it's easier to come back later like if this was like a database if this uses a database i would actually change the status and save on the database that that's got interrupted and then uh in a second execution i could check which task has got interrupted and then resume from there. So this is actually something that was happening in the in the in the code that I'm working at Hat Hat. Since it's an MVP, we're not using queries yet, like I said. And then uh, we had tests that were running; they were getting interrupted, but we they got stuck on running forever because uh, we didn't know that the status got changed it because just because the pod restarted or something happened. And okay. It said we introduced a new status. And I think 
the, the last thing here is that what happens if we actually get this code and run it inside of a Kubernetes cluster, if, you, if we get it to a production-like environment, what, how, how is it going to behave? And how can we make sure that it's going to work? One of the, one of the struggles that I had when I did that was that we have a, a super nice gotcha here that Kubernetes is going to send you like not an OS interrupt because this is something that, that you get from your keyboard, but you need uh, an OS, you need to listen to an OS C term. Actually, I think it's, I think it's a different package you can check here OS interrupt is just a, a variable that points to sys call sig int uh, and they do not expose a sig term like that so we go directly to sys call and get sig term here uh, this is something that actually took me a long long time to figure out because this is one of the cases of it's working on my machine and I don't know why it doesn't work when I deploy my application. It really, like, I really didn't know. Um, so one thing that we can do is, like, create container file. It's like here. This is like a standard container file for, for Go. It's going to use... Uh, a two, two step uh, build, multi step build on Docker to build your application and then get your binary and run to the scratch image. So it's a super tiny Go image. So we can see. Um, here we are. Oh, yeah. I did not. I did not do something super important, which is like do a Go mod in it, in my, in my code. So I, I was using Go mod here, but I didn't need it. So now it should be good. Yeah, I have my Go mod file. All right. Nice. I have a. I have an image here that I can. I can run if I want. For the sake of time, I'm going to actually get the image that I already have built uh, and run. Like, I have an image on Docker.io that I publish it. This would be like the Kubernetes deployment for that image. But if you build it locally uh, with that container file and host it somewhere or use your local registry, you should be able to create a, a local cluster and play with it too. So I'm, I'm using that one that I already have here. And what I can do is like apply that, that image deployment. And I have some, I have a pod running here with that. Let me make it bigger. Okay. So I have a pod running, I can get the logs here. And I'm in the code that I wrote before. Uh, I was printing that as low go routine started. Uh, so if I go over there and literally delete the pod, oops, I think it already stopped running. Is that it? Yeah, it's it's not that slow apparently. Uh, let me go back to the. Yeah, it's not that slow, apparently. I'm going to have to be faster. Uh, Kubcuddle, get pods. Probably a minute or so. Try it again. CC3 is still okay. And then uh, it actually prints the, the shutdown status. If you look up there, it has the test status interrupted and things like that. So it's catching the interruption sign out. It, it's doing what it needs to do. And then closing your app. Another gotcha for uh, Docker uh, and Kubernetes and things like that is that 
depending on the the time that you need to wrap up your application like this was super fast because it was an example uh of things that were just in memory but if you needed to do like uh if i needed to run a two minute uh two minute like code here block of code here i need a higher termination grace period that is because um but kubernetes has a, a termination grace period by default but if you need more than uh i think it's 30 seconds something like that so if you need more than that you actually need to say hey i need two minutes here thank you uh and then uh, kubernetes will actually wait for you after this grace period ends if you didn't do anything uh your application is just gonna interrupt with a with a CQ that you cannot catch. So make sure that you have this uh, set up correctly, and you can probably do the same and apply the same things for uh, long running tests that you have on your Go application. And this is gonna be useful exactly when you wanna when you wanna build some MVP when you still are not ready to. Uh, when you are not ready to actually uh, move to a QAWE system, when you when you know that it is some kind of process that you want to move to a RepTMQ or a Kafka uh, sort of QAWE, but uh, you were not sure if it is the right time yet. So you can use GoRoutines to do uh, this kind of work that is running concurrently that can be longer, but you also have to make sure that if it's too long, you have some sort of way to catching the system signals and understanding uh, what's going on uh, if, if your program waits and, and if your program stops somehow. So I think that's it. I'm not sure if uh, anyone has any questions, but I'm happy to take them here or like on Twitter or somewhere else. And that will be all. <laughs> Hi, thanks, Bianca, for your interesting presentation and showing us the code and explaining us the whole the an entire flow of it um, uh, i don't see any questions in the q a section at the moment all right and that's it i mean i'm happy to 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 chat any time about go about go routines about any of that Hello, Augie. I have my manager here <laughs> watching the, <laughs> the presentation. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, I have to take I have it, I have to take any questions afterwards, chat about it anytime. Just ping me and I'm going to be happy to share. Sure. Thanks a lot, Bianca, once again. Thank you.